Hello. I actually ended up dancing. I heard that. Who said I was dancing? I actually did end up dancing, and Ava can testify to that. Um, hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Hugh O'Gorman. I'm the head of uh, acting at Cal State Long Beach, and I'm the course coordinator for the Michael Chekhov acting technique. Um, so, uh, a couple things before I talk about tonight's presentation. Um, just please note that the exits are both on your left and your right. Uh, if we need to evacuate, that's how you will leave and be kind to your fellow human being as you do so. Um, please turn your phones off uh, entirely, no texting. Please, during the show, we ask that there's uh, no photography and no videography, no moving pictures, and however else you might capture the evening besides in your, your being. Um, just a reminder, the culminations at the end of the week, starting on Friday with the Michael Chekhov Technique at 2 o'clock on Friday, um, which is always one of the highlights of our week. Um, you know, just uh, thinking about how to introduce uh, what you're about to uh, witness and uh, receive, kind of thinking about receiving things in our being, I think is a great place. I've been kind of blown away by all the, uh, the presentations and the lectures so far, by everybody, writers, painters. Um, and, and what I thought was how much we have in common as artists. Mm -hmm. And it's been extraordinary. We were sitting up last night in the lobby uh, of the, uh, the faculty dorm talking with the cross disciplines about the power of listening and being fully present and opening yourself and bringing your full self to the work, even if it's kind of scary. And how, as a writer or a painter or an actor or a dancer, we all have that in common. But by doing so, we all become more present. It just really struck me. I just want to thank everybody that's shared before this evening and how impressive all your talks and lectures have been. Um, in thinking about tonight, what you're about to see is a film um, called The Beautiful Hills of Brooklyn, which began as a, a, a journal recording um, and became a one-woman show in New York City that began uh, at the 92nd Street Y and then moved to another theater in Baltimore uh, I happened to see this in Groznyan, uh, Croatia, at a Michael Chekhov workshop there in 2004. Um, and it was performed by one of our guest artists tonight um, and this week, who's been with us uh, this week, Joanna Merlin. Um, for those of you who don't know Joanna, um, she actually was, was a student of Michael Chekhov's himself in Los Angeles and is the, the last remaining student of Michael Chekhov who's actually teaching his work, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, she made her Broadway debut at 19, opposite Sir Lawrence Olivier. She created the role of Zeidel in the original production of Fiddler on the Roof. She went on to have a storied career in both TV and film, playing Julia Roberts' uh, mother in Mystic Pizza, among other notable things, and is still seen on TV today in Law and Order SVU. Still working today. Um, another member of the Misha Michael Chekhov community, um, a wonderful actor from Germany who came to study here in the United States, who has become an amazing and inspirational acting teacher and director, um, and has become now the head of his own uh, theater company and, um, and school, the Michael Chekhov School in Hudson, New York, uh, Ragnar Freibank. Ragnar and Joanna got together and they decided to take the one woman show out of the theater and capture it on film. So what you're about to see tonight is uh, a film about 45 minutes in length. It was accepted at over um, a dozen different uh, film uh, festivals around uh, the world, uh, winning uh, Best Short and a number of them. Um, it came out about 10 years ago now, a little under that perhaps. Um, and they'll be here after the show. They'll come up on the stage to do a Q&A with you. Um, 
and DVDs are available in the lobby for $10 after the show. <laughs> but I think probably more than anything, any gift uh, a teacher can give their student is to actually walk the walk of the work. And you're about to see that. So, the beautiful hills of Brooklyn. process um, that yes yeah, so that was the process of writing it that we would meet in Joanna's kitchen and Joanna would read something and I would indeed close my eyes and just kind of say what I saw but then what happened after is that Joanna would write it down and that way these images took on you know substance and what happened for me is that at the very beginning, the relationship to these images were very loose and I would just kind of say what I, I saw. But then there came the time that all of a sudden it then, it had almost its own shape. And then I could, then, then it started to be a script in a sense of all of a sudden it had, it had reality. It was just not images, the images started to talk to each other or to speak to each other to make a kind of world and yeah that that was then our shooting script and that was then for the shoot itself something out of which I always could find um, certainty on set because I 
I could trust the images. And even if I didn't, didn't understand what exactly they meant or why it had to be like that, I could, I could feel if it was wrong. And then I would just say, that's not right. But I wouldn't know why, but it didn't feel right. It, didn't, it wasn't the image that came out of the, you know, out of the material, but not just the material, also out of Joanna's way of speaking it. The little girl in the red dress is my granddaughter. Aww. She's now 13. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know how, how, how old the movie is. <laughs> <laughs> We shot it in the winter, we shot it in the winter, and so we only had about eight hours of light per day, and we, it was shot in eight days, except for that one scene in the park where we waited until the spring and shot for one day. So we were shooting about 15 scenes a day, and, and really working uh, very quickly. But um, somehow or another, it, it, uh, it came together, and, and Ragnar's was with the editor most of the time, uh, and we had a wonderful editor. So we were very fortunate uh, um, for a lot of different reasons. And what I feel is that the film kind of honors the voice of, of Jesse Sylvester. Um, I think it's hard for young people to imagine what it's like to be an older person. And older people are not portrayed very often. And uh, I think that this film, because it tracks her daily life in very, or her very kind of small, ordinary life, um, it kind of portrays uh, some of the experiences of being an older person. And um, I think she was kind of amazing because she worked, as, as we said, for 59 years. Every day she took the subway from Brooklyn to Manhattan to work in the, in the office of the Society for Automotive Engineers. And she was 78 when she retired. And they had moved to Pittsburgh, and they wanted her to come with them. Uh, and she decided, though, it was enough that she could stay home in Brooklyn. But she was alone, basically. And she was on a low budget, and she was independent, and she was going to the senior center going to the poetry classes and the psychodrama and she would she was political and went to the ethical culture society and I think you know that that older people still have their lives and their stories if they're fortunate enough to, to be able to function um, even in a, in a slightly diminished way uh, she was still trying when she had the dementia to go to the senior center and so she had a real life force and I think that the reason that she kept a diary was because she was a secretary. And that's what she had done all her life. And I think it made, it gave some importance to these activities of going to the grocery store or going to the senior center or, or whatever. So she kind of created a life for herself. And, um, uh, and, and that, that really, person who found the diary in a chest in Jessie's room, her old apartment, after she died. Nobody knew that she had written this diary. Nobody had seen it. And it was discovered by Ellen Cassidy, who was a writer. And so she edited it. I mean, there were, you know, there was much more material. But um, she created it into, into this play. And, um, and I'm very grateful that she did that. Jesse's, Jesse's voice is being heard somewhere, somewhere, sometime. Uh, and that was why we wanted to make the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll also say, like, so um, what this project meant for me personally was basically Joanna had asked me, would, would I direct the film? And I had never directed a film before, so I didn't know how to do it.
do it, obviously. <laughs> but, um, so what Joanna just spoke about, I can, you know, we are, we are colleagues, we are friends, and I could feel the heart of it, and the heart was, I could always feel the heart when you were speaking about it, and I could feel the heart of the material when you were speaking the material. And I think that's why it kind of, why this process kind of worked of closing my eyes because it was like, you know, it's hard to describe, but I would say it's kind of like the sound of how you read it kind of paints images. And then by speaking them and then, then kind of remembering them, they become like a trace for something and all of a sudden something is, starts to be visible. And then what, I, what might be interesting to share for you, for you guys and ladies is that, um, so there's an image, the image might be we see her, so I would go we see her feet. And then in the collaboration with Eddie, the cinematographer, he would then ask before the shooting, you know, but how do we see her feet? Do we see them from above? Do we see them from And I'm going, no, 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 no. We see them as she's walking and we are moving. Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay. So, you know, so, but it means the, the once there's an image and the moment we begin, or the, the, so I've discovered the moment somebody asks, I notice what I know. At first, I just go, yeah, we see her. And then he goes, you want to wait? I go, no, in her kitchen. She's in her kitchen. So gradually, you know, there's a lot of knowledge, almost intuitive or image knowledge, and it, it only surfaces really through these famous questions. You know, how will we do it through a question? Like the moment we ask the question, in a way the image unfolds. Um, and so personally, for, for me, this process, what was such a gift is the collaboration with a lot of, you know, with film people who would then, then ask me also, Bob Jerison, the wonderful editor, before the shoot, when I had written, you know, when Joanna had written down, had seen, but that was then the script, you know, we, she does this and then we see this, he would then ask me, how do we get from there to there? And I go, well, that's such a good question. <laughs> and then, you know, and then just go, well, how is it? And, and some, you know, technically, I guess you can call them transitions, but it really, it's like, well, I don't want to say what it means to me, but some journeys from one particular world of images to another world of images, and what got us there, those, those were, um, this, uh, this unfolded in a way through questions that people asked me, and that I basically, you know, would, would kind of go, yeah, how is it, and just follow the image, and the image would, would kind of be obvious, because when it was the wrong image, it would just feel a little yucky and a little like boring. And if it felt a little bit like fresh, I go, that's the one, that's the one. So I thought I'd share that. Shall we ask for a few questions? Anybody want to ask any questions? We have a microphone, it can migrate. Thank you. Hello? Oh. I really enjoy the times when um, Jesse decided to um, speak to the camera or speak to us. Um, and I was just wondering how you, or what the process was of choosing those moments um, to have her look at the camera as opposed to hearing her voice um, and what went with that. Um, like how did you know when to have her look at the camera and when to have us just hear her voice? We've thought about that. <laughs> the image won. <laughs> we said, no, 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 you don't get to speak to the camera until, you know, ten minutes later. I said, but that's crazy. <laughs> but, but it was, it, it was a, a choice that Ragnar made, and I think it was an interesting one, but he can explain why. Well, there's no real particular reason except if it felt right. You know, I don't know if I, I give me a, a second because there is a there's a journey that I have with the film, but I'm a little reluctant to share it because I would like for you to have the journey you are having with the film. So all I can say is. That's pretty 
three by six. Follow the, the trace of the blinking light. <laughs> so, my question was actually similar to the previous one, and I was wondering, Joanna, what was the process like working directly with a camera as opposed to a scene partner or the audience? And did you have someone in mind when you were telling your story? Did Jesse, was Jesse speaking to someone in particular? accustomed to not working with a partner, but, um, but whenever I felt I needed to speak to someone, I imagined my sister, who's now going to be 90. And there were also, um, there were certain, um, certain things that I did that, that we kind of added. Uh, for instance, the dancing. My mother was, uh, died at 96, and and she loved to dance, and she danced into her 90s. And so, I mean, that was not in the diary about her dancing, but I added that because it felt my mother kind of, uh, this Jesse reminded me a little bit of my mother. And um, so certain, certain things were added from my own personal life, but um, uh, uh, nothing I felt that could not be organic to Jesse's world. <clears throat> it might be interesting in, in this, when, since you mention it, that um, I feel you know, many things were created out of a collaboration, and there's this one scene. It's the scene when you sit on the bed and, you, and you're eating the chocolate. Yeah. It was, um, oh. you know, many, many or basically, uh, uh, you know, images were all like charted throughout the film, but I remember there was one moment that all I knew was that you were going to do something, and I didn't quite know what it was, so you were the only one on set who knew what was going to happen in that moment, including the cameraman, and, and, the, and you can see it if you, you might remember it, but you know, the story goes you know, like a dream, but you might remember there is the moment when Jesse walks away and the, the, we are following her. She walks through a little light-filled corridor and then she walks through a, a narrow corridor in her house and then we, we find her and we, all, we see a doorway and we see her hand reach in and as her hand moves something, the, the camera or our, we kind of move in and we see her and then she eats the, the she has the glasses on and then she eats the piece of chocolate. And I think there is um, a particular energy to, to the fact that, uh, in this case, you know, the performer is, I mean, like how it always is, but in this very much strong sense, the performer is, or you are the center of, of it, and everything on, in the filmmaking is following the actress to down that road, and I feel the not knowing of it created a particular beautiful energy between the camera and your performance. And I just thought I'd share it because it's a very, I think it's as a process very interesting to trust the performer in that way because, yeah, because it's a real event then. Very different than composure and television. see that did that repetition come out of 
the images, or was that there from the very beginning in terms of storytelling and the screenplay or the play itself prior to? It, you know, I mean, the I guess what it is repetition <coughs> in a particular. I mean, I guess both. So the some things were there very clear as images. So for instance, there is an image, if you, I don't know if you remember, there's in, in this particular way, but Jessie is standing in her kitchen and she's opening a cupboard and then we're in the room where she is in the hospital and then we're back in the cupboard and then we're in the room and we're back in the cupboard. Those came as images. That's just how it looked in, when I had my eyes closed. <laughs> and then other t times, you know, it's interesting when you ask the question, I kind of inwardly go, oh, I've never noticed that it goes from the left to right. And I inwardly try, what would it be the other way? And it just doesn't feel quite right. <laughs> so I guess it has to do with, you know, how we get, I mean, technically, how do we get into a shot and how do we get out of the shot? But you could say um, the benefit of me not having any experience, you know, in that field prior, the only thing I had to trust was the image. I didn't know you have to shoot coverage or like all that. I and there I didn't. And when I shot it, and, and I mean when Eddie shot it, and I looked at it, and I thought this is great, and it was one take. I would go, this is great. Let's move on. And because we had what we needed, um, not you know, in any kind of technical sense, but just like the image, the image was somewhere, and now the image had been in a camera. And now, now we'll see what we'll do with it. But I think that's the answer. And I just want to say something about the repetition, because <coughs> we kept going back to the diary, because we wanted that to be the context, and, and we wanted people to know that these were all her words, didn't write anything uh, that was not in the diary. Uh, we transposed some of it, obviously, but um, so that was part of the reason for continuing to go back to the diary. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what was it like since you, thank you, since you started it out on stage and then you adapted it for the film, what was it like for you to travel from like having that connection with an audience and then suddenly having the same character but having to internalize more of it for the camera. Well, in a way, I mean, it was a luxury. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have to project. <laughs> and I could internalize more uh, in front of the camera. And also, because I had done it <coughs> several times, I really felt that I that the character was kind of living in me. And so, uh, you know, that's a kind of bonus because you don't have to start from, from zero, you know, creating a character. And so um, uh, it, it really, I, I felt very supported by the cinematographer and by Ragnar and, and the crew was, was wonderful. Um, and so it, it really was, uh, didn't feel like a huge transition. It just felt like a new place. And of course it was in a, in a real home and we had real furniture and a real refrigerator. And you know, that makes it a lot, a lot easier than just standing on stage and reading out of a diary. So it was, it was really fun. Sorry, I'm gonna add on to that. Did you perform on stage after that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, one of the reasons that I wanted to make the film was that so that it would have a broader audience. And, um, and I just think that it's a much fuller and richer experience on film than it was on stage. Well, I related it, it's 
somewhat, as I said, to my mother and somewhat to my grandmother. Um, as far as my own life is concerned, well, there were just touches. I mean, like, I, in the shower, I sang the ballad for Americans, which I had grown up with. And, um, uh, and I had also run out of hot water a lot. Um, but also, she was a Jewish woman. She lived in Brooklyn, um, which was uh, where I'm living now. But at the time, I didn't live in Brooklyn. But it was, uh, you know, it, it, it felt very familiar. Um, I also had lived in a walk-up. But um, there was just something about Jesse that I related to, uh, our, certainly our lives were very, very different, but um, I just kind of admired her courage. And felt very close to her. And I learned a lot about her from her great niece who had discovered the diary and we spent a lot of time talking about her. By the way, um, when she moved to Great Neck, her dementia got worse, and so she was uh, living in a um, in a senior residence. Uh, I guess it was a kind of nursing home or uh, assisted living facility. And um, she had two boyfriends, <laughs> and she actually lived for another ten years or so. So she didn't. She died at about ninety. So that's a kind of nicer. <laughs> All right, I think we have one more question. Yes, is it my turn? It is. Okay. Um, what I appreciate about the chocolate we were just talking about is that your image of her, because she hadn't mourned, and like her objective was to mourn, and, and once she ate the chocolate, then she mourned, and that's what I, to me it was really beautiful about that. But my question for you, Ragnar, is that. Did you help with the editing of the film, or did you just leave that to the editor? Yeah, I did not leave it to the editor. Because <laughs> <laughs> the feeling I got that it was the, the whole story was very intimate, and, and it touched, I know it touched me because I've had a relative like that, but I thought you maintained that through the whole piece, that intimacy, that humanity that you talk about all the time, and that's what I really appreciate. Thank you all. Thank you. Everybody.